an intro to Forex trading. Forex is short for foreign exchange. It is a worldwide financial market that allows the banks and you to trade currencies. The concept behind trading the market is simple speculation. If you're confident one currency will go up against the other, you buy it and then you can make a profit. Here is an illustration. When traveling to other countries, chances are you've had to swap your dollars or whatever currency you use in your country for the currency of trade in your destination country. There, you may have noticed that there is a screen that shows your different currency rates. These are called exchange rates, and they represent the price of one currency relative to another. Exchange rates let you know how many Swiss francs you'll get in exchange for the $20 bill in your hand. When you make the exchange, what you've essentially done is sold US dollar for Swiss francs, or in forex parlance, you went short on USDCHF. When you're heading back to the States, then you've got to swap your francs for US dollars again, or go long on USDCHF. When you're trading Forex, you want to make a profit from determining which one of two currencies will be weaker than the other and then choosing to buy strength and sell weakness. That's it. Also called the FX market, the foreign exchange market is the world's largest decentralized global market that allows currencies to be exchanged. While the prices of each currency may seem relatively stable at the Bureau de Change, where you swapped dollars for francs, the exchange rates change from second to second. This market boasts $6.6 .6 trillion in the volume of trading transactions each day. The bulk of those transactions are carried by central banks, large banks, hedge funds, and other financial institutions. These markets stay open for retail traders, that's you and me, 24 hours a day, 6 days a week, Sunday to Friday. They stay open for the big boys, the bankers, during the weekends though, which is why you see gaps in the market price when you open up your charts by the next trading week. Forex Trading Sessions There are three main trading sessions in the Forex market where you can get ample liquidity to trade. They are the Asian, London, and New York sessions, with the last two being more liquid than the first one. On account of daylight savings, the times may vary. So to know which session you're trading, depending on where you are in the world, check out forexmarkethours.com. It's a great free website that allows you to put in your time zone and see where each session begins and ends for you in your corner of the world. You really only want to trade during London and New York. It's not that trading Asia is impossible, it's just that the other two markets give ample movement for you to squeeze some pips out. So if you really want a market that moves, check out the London-New York overlap when both markets are active. While bond and stock markets close at the end of the business day, the Forex market stays awake, simply moving to another financial center in the world. A typical trading day begins with the Asian session before moving on to the London session and then the New York session. Currencies in Forex, you trade currencies. You're not buying the physical yen or euro, but you're speculating on their values. It's almost like buying a share in the economy of various countries or selling one. Major currencies are the ones that are traded the most because they are made up of the largest economies in the world. They are USD, the United States dollar, also called the buck, EUR, the Eurozone euro, also called the fiber, JPY, the Japanese Yen, GBP, the Great British Pound, also called the Cable, CHF, the Switzerland Franc, also called the Swissy, CAD, the Canadian Dollar, also called the Looney, AUD, the Australian Dollar, also called the Aussie, NZD, the New Zealand Dollar, called the Kiwi. You've probably noticed that they all have three letters called the ISO 4217 currency codes. Established by the International Organization of Standardization, ISO, in 1973. The first two letters are made up of the country's name, while the last one is the currency's name. You trade currencies through a broker, and they are always traded in pairs. This is because each one is quoted relative to another. For instance, you have the popular euro against the US dollar, called 
EUR USD. Then there's the Swissy against the Yen, which is CHF JPY. So you can only ever trade Forex in pairs, buying or selling one for the other. There are three kinds of currency pairs. The majors, which always have the US dollars as one side of the equation. The crosses, which do not have the US dollar ever, also called miners. The exotics, which have one major currency paired against an emerging economy's currency. In Forex, the price of major moves a lot more than the exotics and the crosses, as they are the most traded pairs. This means you'll get a lot of trading opportunities with them. They are EUR USD, Euro Dollar, USD JPY, Dollar Yen, GBP USD, Pound Dollar, USD CHF, Dollar Swissy, USD CAD, Dollar Looney, AUD USD, Aussie Dollar, NZD USD, Kiwi Dollar. The majors are the most liquid pairs you can trade. When I say liquid, I mean that they have a lot of financial activity. So the next time you hear the word liquidity, you'll know what that means. A market is liquid because of the volume of trading activity. Crosses and miners. Crosses are pairs that don't have the USD in them. They aren't often traded like the miners, but they are relatively liquid, so they can still give you generous trading opportunities. The most traded crosses are pairs that have EUR, JPY, and GBP. Euro crosses, EUR, CHF, or the Euro Swissy, EUR, CAD, or the Euro Looney, EUR, GBP, or the Euro Pound, EUR, NZD, or the Euro Kiwi, EUR, AUD, or the Euro Aussie, EUR, SEK, or the Euro Stocky, EUR, NOK, or the Euro Naki, Yen Crosses, EUR, JPY, or the Euro Yen, GBP, JPY, or the Pound Yen, also called the Guppy or the Dragon, CAD, JPY, or the Looney Yen, CHF, JPY, or the Swissy Yen, AUD, JPY, or the Aussie Yen, NZD, JPY, or the Kiwi Yen, Pound Crosses, GBP, CAD, or the Pound Looney, GBP, AUD, or the Pound Aussie, GBP, CHF, or the Pound Swissy, GBP, NZD, or the Pound Kiwi. Other crosses. AUD CAD or the Aussie Looney or Aussie CAD. AUD CHF or the Aussie Swissy. AUD NZD or the Aussie Kiwi. CAD CHF or the Looney Swissy or CAD Swiss. NZD CAD or the Kiwi Looney or Kiwi CAD. NZD CHF or the Kiwi Swissy. The Exotics. These pairs have one primary currency pegged to the currency of EMs or emerging economies like Mexico, Brazil, Hungary, Turkey, or Chile. Not every broker offers these pairs to trade, but here's a list of the currencies you may find on yours paired against the US dollar, euro, and pound. The Brazilian real, BRL. The Hong Kong dollar, HKD. The Saudi Arabian Rial, SAR. The Singaporean Dollar, SGD. The South African Rand, the ZAR. The Thailand Bot, THB. The Russian Ruble, RUB. The Mexican Peso, MXN. The Polish Zloty, PLN. The Chilean Peso, CLP. The Norwegian Kron, NOK, the Swedish Krona, SEK. There are several other exotic currencies you could trade, but these are the most commonly offered ones. With the exotics, you will find that the spreads are several times larger than with the majors. This is because they don't have as much liquidity, and they're usually a lot more affected by economic events and geopolitical news. For example, if a war breaks out in one of these countries, 
potentially causing the price of that currency to drastically plummet relative to the major currencies, creating more movement than you could ever find on the majors. This is something to keep in mind if you choose to trade these pairs. Volume Volume is the amount of the currency pair being traded over time. It's about the number of units that are exchanged between buyers and sellers. There are certain times when the markets aren't quite as liquid as you'd like them to be. In these times, the volumes of trades are too low to make anything out of it, unless your trading strategy requires that you have low volume and liquidity to begin with. Volume is essential because you need it to confirm that the patterns you see on your charts are actually valid and that the market is really moving in the direction you think it is. When there are significant changes in the asset price with high volume, that means the move is more important, and you should look for ways to get in on that. So, volume is beneficial when you're analyzing price movement. Trade anywhere, anytime. The Forex market isn't like the London Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange, where all trading happens in one location. Instead, this is an over-the-counter market, which means it's all done electronically, on the interbank network, 24 hours a day, and for retail traders, six days a week. As long as you have an internet connection, then you can trade. While you can trade whenever you want to, a good rule of thumb is to avoid trading on Sundays, Mondays, and Fridays. On the first two days, the market needs time to determine how to respond to weekend news, and you should also allow it to show you where it wants to go. On Fridays, the volume can be low, or there may be too much volatility on account of significant news releases. Bank holidays are an excellent time to stay out unless you have experience trading at these times and a broker who gives you a fair spread. Finally, do not trade significant news events. You can tell when they're about to happen by going to Forex Factory's website and checking the news calendar. Anything flagged as high or medium means you should stay out until at least five minutes after the news release. Getting a broker. When you want to find a broker, you want one with tight spreads. The tighter the spreads, the faster you can get into your profit on your trades, and the quicker you can make them risk-free by moving your stop loss to break even. Also, you want a broker who has accreditation from the national regulatory bodies so that they will treat you fairly and so that you're protected if you and your broker have a dispute that wasn't your fault to begin with and costs you money. Be sure to get familiar with their terms and conditions before you sign up for an account. This way, you already know what you're getting into. For example, some brokers don't allow hedging, trading in both directions, or scalping, entering trades with colossal lot sizes only to get out in a matter of minutes or seconds with a few pips of profit. So, you want to know what's good and what may lead to a termination of your account. Most brokers offer demo accounts so you can paper trade or demo trade and get a feel for what trading is like. Now, you should keep in mind that demo trading isn't the same as live trading, psychologically or financially. The demo trading lets you get used to the trading platform, practice your strategy to see how viable it is, and test other parameters with your trading. You cannot withdraw demo money. If you could, we'd all be retired. Also, you'll find that you might get excellent fills on price when trading the news with a demo account, but this is not guaranteed when you're in the live markets with real funds. This is just something to keep in mind if you stubbornly decide to trade the news. Check out the reviews for the brokers before you choose one. You can look them up on Forex Peace Army. You want a broker with good reviews, but be careful that they aren't paid reviews. You'll know it's fake when they all sound generic or come on the same day or from the same place. Also, a good broker will usually respond to any negative complaints or issues on the forum, intending to clear the air or fix any problems. If they're still replying even now, chances are they are a broker you can trust. Good brokers also offer you various trading platforms, from the tried-and-true MetaTrader 4 to MetaTrader 5, Android, Apple, web, and desktop versions are usually given, to the sleek and modern C-Trader, also available for phone, desktop, and web. There are two kinds of brokers, the market makers and the electronic communications networks, ECN. 
The former set their own prices with the ask and spread and manipulate prices to take out stop losses. The latter use the best ask and bid prices they can get from interbank institutions and usually charge a tiny commission for your trades. It's up to you to work out which kind you prefer. Beware that some brokers go rogue, manipulating their prices to rip off traders, slowing down execution time for your trades, refusing to honor your stop loss and take profit levels, and more. So you really should take your time when choosing one. I won't recommend a broker in this book, but if you do your homework and follow the criteria given here, you'll find a great broker to trade with. How you make money trading Forex. You make money by selling or buying currencies. In Forex speak, going long on the euro dollar means you're going to buy the euro, expecting that it will rise in value relative to the dollar. Going short on the euro dollar means you expect that the euro's value will fall relative to the dollar, and so you will sell. You may also hear the terms bullish and bearish. Buyers are the bulls in the market, pushing prices higher, while sellers are the bears. When you have no positions running, that means you're square or flat. The point of trading is to make money from the price difference. If you're bullish on the dollar versus the loonie, that means you expect to make money as the price goes higher from when you placed your trade. When you're bearish, you hope to make money as the exchange prices between those currencies goes lower in your favor. In a bullish scenario, you could buy 10,000 Great British Pounds against the dollar at the exchange rate of 1.17000. GBP 10,000 times 1.17 equals US $11,700. Then a couple of weeks later, the price rallies to 1.2500, so you liquidate or close that trade. GBP 10,000 times 1.25 equals US $12,500. In this case, you've made $800 profit. The exchange rate between both currencies in GBP CAD show you how many pounds you can buy with one Canadian dollar or how many loonies you need to buy one pound. Base and quote currencies. To trade successfully, you need to know how to read the Forex quotes. As mentioned before, they always are written in pairs. The first currency in a pair is the base currency. For example, the base currency in EUR and OK is the Euro. It is the reference currency and is always worth just one. The second currency is the quote currency, also called the counter currency. In our example, that would be the Norwegian krona. So, the exchange rate lets you know how many units of the quote currency you will need before you can buy one unit of the base currency. So if the price of EUR USD is 1.77351, that means you need to pay 1.77351 US dollars to buy one euro. When you're selling, the exchange rate will let you know how many units of the counter currency you will get for selling one unit of the base currency. This means you will get 1.77351 when you sell one euro. There is a standard for quoting Forex currency pairs that all brokers respect, so you never have to worry about which one is the base or the quote. Just know that EURUSD will always be EURUSD, not USD EUR. There may be a slash a dot, or nothing at all in between these currencies listed on your broker. In the end, it's all the same. Your Forex account. The spread. Bid and ask prices. Forex quotes always have two prices called the bid and the ask. The bid is the price your broker offers to exchange the base currency for the quote. It's the price the broker buys from you when you sell. So to keep this simple, anytime you sell a pair, you will be offered the bid price. The ask is the price at which you exchange the quoted currency for the base. In other words, it's the price you get to buy the currency pair at if you choose to get into a trade. The spread is the difference between the asking price and the bidding price. So if you put a trade on, you will always pay the spread. When you want to sell GBP USD, all you do is click the sell button and you will be offered the bid price, which shows up as a line on your chart. When you buy GBP USD, you'll get the asking price. The bid price is always lower than the asking price. It makes sense because if you're going to make a profit, you should buy low and sell high. You want to make a profit, and so does your broker. 
one of the ways they make their money is through the spread. That's why when you put a trade on, you're immediately a few pips or pipettes or points in the red. Your broker may also charge you a commission for each transaction, especially if they offer really tight spreads. All about pips. Trading is about making pips and keeping them. A pip is the measurement of the change in value between currencies, and it is made up of 10 points or pipettes. But nobody really talks about points or pipettes all that much in Forex. When GBP USD moves from 1.35500 to 1.35510, it has moved by one pip, which is 0 0.0001. A quick note. Some brokers are five-digit brokers, which means the number of figures after a decimal point is always five, except for yen pairs, where the digits after the decimal are always three. These are fractional pips, and they are always a tenth of a full pip. So, say price moved from 1.35500 to 1.35513. That means price moved by 13 points or pipettes, or by 1.3 pips. Other brokers are four-digit brokers, which means they only use four digits after a decimal point, and two digits on yen pairs. So in our example, the price moved by one pip and not ten pips. Many newbies make the rookie mistake of saying they made a hundred pips when they really made ten. To give another illustration, when the price moves from 119.200 to 119.210 on USDJPY, it has moved by just one pip. If it moved to 119.213, then it moved by 1.3 pips, or 13 points. Calculating pip values. Every currency has its own value relative to others, which means every currency pair pays out different amounts. To keep things simple, I'll revert to using just four digits when quoting prices so that you can work out the math quickly. Assume that USDCHF is at 1.0400. This means 1 USD equals 1.04 CHF. To calculate the value change of just one pip, you divide that pip by the exchange rate value and multiply it by 1. 1 pip equals 0.0001 CHF. Exchange ratio equals 1 USD divided by 1.0400 CHF. 0.0001 divided by 1.0400 times 1 equals 0.0000,9615 USD per unit approximately. So if you trade 10,000 units of USD CHF, then when the price changes by a pip, that would be a change of USD 0.96 approximately. Your trading account could be in a different currency other than the dollar. This means you need to work out the value of a pip differently. Just divide or multiply the pip value you arrive at using the method above by your account currency's exchange rate position. If this all seems a bit too much for you, don't sweat it. Your broker already automatically works it out for you, and you could always go online to use free pip value calculators. Lots. The amounts you trade in are known as lots. These are the number of units of each currency sold or bought. Lots are how you measure the size of your trade transaction. Every time you put an order on, it's quoted in lots. The standard lot size has 100,000 currency units. The mini lot size has 10,000 currency units. Micro lots have 1,000 currency units. Nano lots, rarely used, have 100 currency units. Some brokers forego lots and show you the value of your trade in currency units, but lots are really a lot more convenient. For you to take advantage of the movement and price of pips, you need to have access to large amounts of currency before you can gain actual profits or make significant losses because that happens too. If you're using a standard lot, let's see how that will change the value of a pip for you. If USDJPY is at an exchange rate of 118.90, 0 0.02 divided by 118.90 times 100,000 equals GBP 8.4 times 118.90. If USDCAD is at an exchange rate of 1.5000, 0 0.0002 divided by 1.5000 times 100,000 equals $6.9 per pip. 
when the base currency isn't the dollar, the math changes. If GBP USD is at an exchange rate of 1.1830, 0 0.0001 divided by 1.1830 times 100,000 equals 8.5 times 1.1830 equals $10 per pip approximately. Your broker will let you know the value of each pip on their website, or you can just send them an inquiry. Leverage the money you trade as part of a retail is nothing compared to what the central banks trade. You can't make any money with it unless your broker gives you leverage. The leverage available to you depends on your broker and your risk appetite. First, you must make a deposit with your broker. This is known as a margin. Then your broker will let you know how much of that margin you need to trade your positions. Say your leverage is 100 to 1, which is 1% of the position in question, and you want to trade a position that's worth 100,000. But then, the trouble is, all you have is 10,000 as your margin. Your broker will then parcel off 1,000 of your margin for the trade and allow you to borrow the remaining 99,000. If you make any profits, they show up in your account balance and increase your margin. If you lose, your account balance goes down. The minimum margin requirement differs from one broker to the next. So with a broker who asks for a 1% margin, each 100,000 position you trade will require a deposit of 1,000. Please know that the margin requirement isn't a fee, but a deposit. In other words, it will still be there after you've closed your trade, assuming you closed in profit. If you're in a trade and your account balance goes below 1,000, then you get a margin call, which is when the broker stops you out of your trade. If they don't do this, there's a risk of your account going into the negative and then you'll owe them money. Types of orders. An order tells your broker to open or close a trade on your behalf if it meets the requirements you set for them. There are two basic kinds of orders, market orders and pending orders. The market order is executed right away with the current price that your broker is offering you. You use a pending order when you'd rather execute your trade at a different price than what the broker's offering currently. There are various kinds of pending orders. If you want to buy at a lower price than the current price, you place a buy limit order. If you want to buy at a higher price than you have on your chart at the moment, you set a buy stop order. If you're going to sell higher than the spot price, you place a sell limit order. Want to sell lower? Then set a sell stop order. These orders remain pending, only to be executed if the price arrives at your specified level. You also have a stop-loss order. This is very important, and if you know how to use it correctly with a good strategy, it will save you from going bust when you have losing trades. For example, say you want to buy at 1.5010. You'd put your stop-loss 10 pips away, which is 1.5000. If the price moves down against your position, once it hits the 1.5010, your broker will close the trade to protect you from losing any money. There's the take profit order, which tells your broker when to take you out of a successful trade. Once you're in a trade and you were right about the direction, your broker will close it for you at that level so that you can keep the pips you made. There's no point in trading if you're going to keep leaving money on the table. When you're trading, you don't have to exit a trade completely if you don't want to. Instead, you could choose to protect the profits you make with a different kind of stop-loss order called the trailing stop. The trailing stop adjusts itself along with the fluctuations of price. For instance, say you have a stop-loss of 20 pips and a trailing stop of 20 pips, and the price just moved in your favor by 20 pips. Then the stop-loss would move to secure your trade at the entry or break-even, leaving 20 pips of room between it and the current price. If the market starts to go against you, don't worry. Your trailing stop will not move. Instead, it will remain right where it is at break-even until the price hits it and takes you out of the market, or the price moves your way so you're up by 40 pips. If the latter happens, then the trailing stop will move to secure 20 pips of profit so that even if you get taken out of the market, you have secured some money. Other orders include good till cancelled or GTC. Your broker won't ever cancel the order unless you give the order to do so. Good for the day or GFD. Your order will remain active until the trading day is over. One cancels the other, 
or OCO. This allows you to place two orders below and above the price. When one order becomes active, the other is canceled. One triggers the other, or OTO. One order is only triggered if another order kicks in. Placing trades. Order executions vary from platform to platform and broker to broker. However, you need to be aware of a few things before placing your order, regardless of your trading method. First, your decision will be informed by the strategy you use to trade. 1. First, work out whether you're going to buy or sell a currency pair. 2. Go over your analysis and make sure that is the direction you want to trade and you know where you want to get out if the trade wins or loses. 3. Ensure you have multiple reasons for expecting the trade to play out the way you think it will. These reasons put together are called confluence. 4. Check your tools and indicators to be sure they're giving you the right signals. 5. Figure out your take profit target by using previous areas where price reacted strongly. 6. Choose your order type. 7. Enter your lot size, never risking more than 2% of your account balance per trade. 8. Set your stop loss and take profit levels before you pull the trigger. By going through this list or something similar, you can structure your trades so you're not just taking them based on blind luck and you can prevent silly mistakes like buying a standard lot of USDJPY on a $100 account. It happens more often than you think. Once the trade is on, you must monitor it. You don't have to sit at your charts and disregard every other aspect of your life. You can just set price alerts so you know if the price has hit your stop loss, SL, your take profit, TP, or the level at which you want to go break even, BE. When you place your trades and your alert levels, do yourself a favor and walk away. Only come back if you get any alerts. Finally, never move your stop loss. You should make sure you put it in a safe spot so that it definitely means the trade was invalid if it does get hit. When you move your stop loss, you're teaching yourself a terrible habit that will one day ruin you with a considerable loss. Trading isn't about always being right, as you will learn later in this book. It's about being right enough times and having more than enough ammo to come back at it later when you're wrong. Whenever you feel like moving your stop loss or risking more money than you should, remember that the markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent there's always going to be another setup. Walk away and try some other time again. Analyzing the markets and yourself. To trade, you need a strategy or plan of action. To create a successful strategy, you need to become a researcher. You need to get all the information you can about the markets you will be trading and the influences on the assets' prices. This means you must learn how to analyze price action and market conditions. The most common ways to analyze the markets are 1. Fundamental analysis 2. Technical analysis and 3. Market sentiment Fundamental analysis This process involves developing a trading strategy based on news and data that show the country's economic strengths and weaknesses that affect their associated currencies. If a country is doing well economically, its success should be apparent in the strength of its currency. Also, when a country's economy isn't so hot, you will see that reflected by the weakness in its currency. In other words, everyone wants to buy the dollar when it's hot and drop it like it's hot when it's not. Figuring out which currency is stronger than which will show you the best pairs to trade and which ones not to bother with because their currencies are equally strong or equally weak. The info you get to carry out this sort of analysis is known as fundamentals. All fundamental data involves news on all scales, from macroeconomic events to global issues and more local, national occurrences. You use fundamentals to determine the likely impact they will have on the currency markets and forecast possible trends. According to fundamental traders, when you can work out how the market will react, you can then plan your trades and capitalize on the volatility caused by these economic events. Not all news events will move prices by hundreds of pips. Non-farm payrolls are so massive in their effect that even non-US currencies are affected, or at least that used to be the case every time. Other events barely affect the price at all. Some websites show you the news events which have weight and the ones that don't. 
Generally, you should look out for the following data because they will rock your charts and might give you good trades after they have been released. Interest rate decisions. Employment rates. Trade balance reports. Retail sales figures. Inflation reports. Gross domestic product information. Durable goods reports. Speeches by central bank heads and presidents. You can use resources to track all this data, available online and in the news as well. You can also set up alerts to know when each event is about to occur or has occurred. You have the option of only getting notified when it involves the currencies you trade, because you don't have to trade every single thing your broker offers unless you want to go broke. If you decide you want to be a fundamentals trader, then you should know which news releases to expect at the start of each week, or better yet, look them up over the weekend and plan for them. It will help you immensely if you journal your expectations, especially for the events you feel will have the most influence, so you can plan your trades. Trading Fundamentals When there is a news release and it's in line with everyone's expectations, there won't be much movement in the prices of the pairs. However, suppose the news release results are significantly different from what everyone else expected. In that case, fundamental traders expect there's most likely to be a strong market reaction. When the news release is significant, the market goes quiet for some minutes before it comes out, anticipating the figures. Then, shortly after the release of unexpected figures, the price will move explosively, but only for a very short period, and then the markets will usually correct themselves after. If you want to trade news, you've got to have the best internet, a fast computer, and quick fingers. You also need a broker who doesn't widen the spreads too much. This is because the spreads are always wider than usual, just before and after a news release, no matter how excellent your broker is. When trading interest rates, know that when the rates are up, the corresponding currency will rise. When trading employment figures, know the higher employment numbers means more people in the workforce, which means a strong economy and a strong currency. When trading the gross domestic product figures, know that the higher they are, the stronger the currency. Durable goods orders are a market of manufacturing power. Retail sales show how much people spend money in a country or don't. The latter two aren't as important as the events mentioned above. Beware the funny mentals. One problem with trading news is that market volatility skyrockets to the point where you can see 50 or even 100 pip movements in a matter of a second. If you can react that fast, then chances are you're a robot and you don't know it. Prices change so rapidly with wild fluctuations. You can't be sure your broker will be able to fill you in at the price you want because of this erratic behavior of price, and whether you might get filled at the very end of a move with your stop loss too far away because of the widespread. This is known as slippage, and it's how many newbie accounts have gone bust. The other issue with trading fundamentals, or funny mentals, is that they aren't quite reliable. For instance, there have been too many times when news that should have been bullish for the dollar caused all USD XXX pairs to plummet at best or whipsaw back and forth for several hundreds of pips, leaving many new traders scratching their heads wondering where $99,999 of their $100,000 account just disappeared to. Also, those who study price action and institutional order flow will tell you over and over that before the news is released, you can actually see where the price is going to go from just studying the charts. This is why I'm an advocate for the following kind of analysis. Technical analysis. Technical analysis is the study of price action and market structure to determine possible trends in the market. In other words, technical traders don't care what the news has to say. They only want to know when it's time for a news event so that they can secure trades that were running before that time. Or the traders want to make sure they don't put any trades at that same time. Or they sit back and watch the central banks manipulate the price and take it where they expect it to go, so they can shadow them and make money when things settle down. The technical trader knows the significance of past prices and how they will likely show where the price will go in the future. There are so many ways to analyze the charts, but one thing remains consistent. You must understand price action. When you understand price action and the price arrives at a level it reacted to in the past, you will know if you should join the prevailing uptrend or downtrend or if you should expect a reversal. 
The technical trader knows how to make sense of the squiggly lines on the chart without needing to check in with Trump or Lagarde about where the dollar or euro will head next. There are three kinds of technical traders. Those who rely on indicators, thinking that these bells and whistles move the price. Spoiler alert, they don't. Those who understand chart patterns, using indicators to trade them. And those who only rely on price action, ignoring everything else. You can be any of these three, provided you don't believe the hype that an indicator is what causes the price to move. Once you understand why price acts the way it does, you will only use them as a confluence and not your sole reason for trading, if you ever use indicators, that is. Market sentiment. Market sentiment is about figuring out the ideas and feelings of other traders like you about the market. You want to know what they're likely to do and why. You want to work out what the herd mentality is about the pair you're looking at. Are traders bullish? Bearish? Neutral? This is what market sentiment seeks to figure out. It's not the easiest thing to understand or measure, but with experience, you'll start to figure out the answers for yourself. What kind of trader are you? Figuring out your trading style isn't an easy thing, and it's not always a fixed choice. As a beginner trader, you will have to experiment with the various trading styles before you finally settle on a strategy and a method that works for you and will not significantly change your lifestyle or drain your funds. You absolutely have to find out what kind of trader you are, though, as this will dramatically affect your trading results and how profitable or not you are in the long term. So, we're going to help you figure out what works best for you. First, I'll get into the major three styles of trading you should check out. Then, we'll sink our teeth into the major ways in which they're different. Finally, We'll make a comparison and then we can arrive at a hopefully clear conclusion about what kind of trader you want to be. But, again, even that decision need not be set in stone. I started out as a scalper, moved on to position trading, and then decided to day trade and scalp on the side. So maybe you'll have a mixture of styles. Let's see what all this scalping business is about. Scalping. This is a trading style where the trader, called a scalper, looks to profit from minimal asset price changes. The scalper opens a large number of trades or huge lot sizes in a single trading session, intending to get as many little wins as they can. The scalper trades the markets with the shortest time frames possible, from the 1 minute chart to the 30, 15, and 5 second charts. For example, they could trade 2 pip Renko charts or 10 tick charts. The options are limitless but ultimately depend on their scalping strategy. The scalper's trades usually only last a few seconds or minutes, but never more than a few hours. Also, the scalper requires higher leverage than other traders. The whole point behind scalping is to get the most you can in the shortest amount of time you can, with the smallest movements possible. What makes the scalper profitable is that they use a substantial position. One way or another, they close their trades before the end of the day or session. To be a scalper, you've got to be quick. There's no time to dawdle and overthink about whether your trade will play out. In extreme situations, you'll open up a trade and close it in a matter of seconds if there's enough movement in your favor. Or against you. Because this trading style is so fast, you need precision with your entries and exits in time and price. In addition, you need a computer that won't fail you and backup internet for your internet. It sounds dramatic, but the last thing you want is to be hundreds or thousands of dollars in the hole for a trade you took just because your internet connection shows the perfect time to go off on you. To trade as fast as you can with your scalping technique, you need to be on the lower time frames from the 5 minute charts and below. You want to wait for a powerful combination of reasons to get into a trade, from critical support and resistance levels to other things your indicator and price tell you. You cannot afford to take any setup that is not a high probability. Finally, scalpers work well with indicators. Some don't use them, but if they help your strategy, you need to know that they're all telling you the same thing. Buy or sell or get out. The indicators are split into support and resistance indicators, or indies in Forex speak, and momentum indicators. Among the popular momentum indicators are the MACD, moving average convergence divergence, the stochastic oscillator, the RSI, relative strength index, the most common support and resistance, SNR, in these are moving averages, Keltner channels, and pivot points. 
To summarize, this trading style is about quick thinking. You'll get more setups than other traders. Also, as a successful scalper, your win rate needs to be higher than that of a regular trader because usually what you risk and what you stand to gain are worlds apart, and you risk more than you earn. To make up for that, you need to win more trades than you lose. Your position size and win rate need to be high so that if and when you do lose, your winning trades cover all losers. Managing your trades as a scalper means you can't take your eyes off the screen, usually. However, if you have a strategy that allows you to use pending orders, trailing stop losses, and so on, then you won't have to deal with this problem. Day Trading Many new traders think that scalping and day trading are the same, but they aren't. Both of them happen in a day, but there are still notable differences between them. The day trader opens and closes fewer trades than the scalper. They can open just one setup for the day, or two at the most, and be done with it. Day traders and scalpers trade intraday, but the day trader is focused on getting the day's best opportunity and will hold on to their trade for a much larger profit goal than the scalper. So, the day trader will hold a trade for hours, but never more than a day. The ultimate goal of this kind of trader is to hold out for a larger piece of the pie with just one trade. This allows them to handle losses better than a scalper, even with a lower win rate. As a day trader, the first thing you do is watch and wait for the price to get to significant levels on the charts where you see the potential to earn more pips than you're about to risk and where the trade is likely to go in your favor. After that, you need to be very patient as the price will move in your favor and then move against you, sometimes several times in a trading day or session. You must also stick to your trading plan and never exit a trade sooner than you should have. If you do, you will eventually burn your account because you took a scalp trade when that wasn't your plan and you're not trading the right strategy or lot size to win at scalping. Your mission then is to seek out the best places to sell and buy an instrument in a day and then make that trade and hold on to it until it hits your target. You'll still use some leverage, of course, but your lot sizes will be more reasonable. Your win rate may be as low as 30%, but as long as your winners are more significant than your losing trades, you can still come out on top. The day trader has various kinds of analyses in their trading arsenal. For example, they can use a combination of indicators like the RSI and MACD, along with candlestick patterns and price action to work out the trends, resistance and support areas, and so on. They can also work with wave and chart patterns to get a better context of the marketplace. Swing trading. Swing traders don't just enter the market all day, every trading day. Instead, they enter and exit sporadically. They see a setup, get in, and hold it for a few days or weeks on end. The point of swing trading is to look for intermediate setups to bag pips from. This is different from position trading, where you can hold a trade for weeks or even months. The swing trader is different from the scalper and day trader because they use lower leverage than the other two. This isn't always the case though, as some swing traders can go much higher in leverage. The swing trader also considers technical and fundamentals usually. I say usually because I knew some of these excellent swing traders who couldn't care less about the funny mentals. As a swing trader, your target is a lot larger, and you have to wait much longer than others for your trades to come to you. Some swing traders have to use wider stop losses, and this is the case for most actually, but you have some who have perfected the art of narrowing down their stop losses to less than 10 pips so they can pull in several times more than that. Some swing traders leave their trades on until just before the weekend while others will hold on to their trades for weeks on end. Swing traders can work with the weekly, daily, 4-hour, and 1-hour charts. Here's how they might do that, although this isn't the rule for every swing trader. The higher time frames, daily, 4-hour, and even monthly charts, are used to scout major support and resistance levels as well as trends. The 4-hour charts are used to scout for patterns that signify a setup is coming. The 1-hour and 4-hour charts are used for entries. Traders who use Elliott Wave Price Theory, Fibonacci, and various price action patterns are likely to swing. The Best Trader Which one of these three options is the best? There's no answer to that question. It all comes down to you. If you aren't quick to change your decisions, and you typically don't budge on significant choices you make unless there's a good reason, 
then you might find success as a swing or position trader. The latter group of traders hold for months and years and are more like investors than actual traders. If you have some patience but not that much, try day trading or swing trading. If you're the kind who thinks on their feet and makes snap judgments, you might be a natural scalper. The only way to know for sure is to test them all out and see how you like it. Scalping is a skill, and not just dumb luck. Experienced traders who have been in the markets for years can do this with ease. They understand how to work with the markets and have developed money and risk management skills to ensure their equity curve stays high. The learning curve for the day trader and swing trader is steep as well, but the skills, emotional control, and experience are nowhere near the same as with scalping. So swing trading and day trading is the best for beginners. Ask yourself the following questions. 1. What style do I gravitate to the most? 2. What goals do I have? Do I want a little income on the side, or do I want to be a full-time trader? 3. What style do I prefer? Technical analysis, fundamentals, or market sentiment analysis? 4. How much time do I have to enter, manage, and exit my positions? More time means you can be more active and shorten your learning curve. It also means you can scalp if that's what you want to do. Swing trading is excellent for those who have full-time jobs because they can hold on for longer and only need to look at their charts for a few minutes each day. This is not the case with day traders and scalpers.